John chapter number 13. I'll give you a little bit of backstory. Chapter number 13 opens up. It's the Passover feast. Verse number 1 says, When Jesus knew that his hour was come and that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, he called a supper. And supper being ended, he started to prepare the disciples. Well, he tried to. A lot of them were caught off guard anyway. But he tried to prote- prepare the disciples for the fact that he was going to be betrayed and not just by anybody but by one of his own then he riseth from supper in verse number 4 laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself poured water into a basin began to wash the disciples feet then we know that he comes to Simon Simon maybe being a little bit of a hothead maybe not thinking about what he was getting ready to say said Lord I don't, you don't need to wash my feet I need to wash your feet he says, I'm not worthy. But you can't fault him. John the Baptist said he wasn't worthy to latch at the sandals of the ones that was going to come after him. Peter was right. He didn't deserve to have the Lord wash his feet. But what did Jesus tell him? He said, Jesus answered him in verse number 8, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. This was not a sign of humility. Lord, that Peter was greater than he was. He was saying, I'm getting ready to prepare you for something, Peter. And if you don't get prepared, you don't have any part with me. And he's saying, everything that you've forsaken, that fishing business that you had, your family, because we do know that Peter had a mother-in-law, so we know that he was married. His wife and his mother-in-law and children, if he had them, I don't know. All of his friends that were in the place that he grew up, place that he lived, place where he developed that fishing business. Forsook it all. And Jesus is saying, you've left it all. You've been through thick and thin with me. You walked on water because you had a little bit of faith, and when that faith failed, I saved you. All of it's for naught if you don't let me do what I'm about ready to do. Then Peter got wise and said, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my, my head too. Well then, Jesus said, hey, that's not the point. I don't need to do that. Okay, again, talking. He just realized, well, Lord, hey, I don't, I don't want to miss out on being with you, so hey, watch everything just to be sure. Jesus said, know what I'm doing. Don't worry about it. Feet's good enough. Okay? We don't have time to get into that. But in verse number 13, he's finished washing their feet. And in verse number 12, at the end of it, he says, Know ye what I have done to you. Verse 13, You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. Notice that's a lowercase l. Neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. I speak not of you all. I know who am I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted me, hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come, that when it come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomever I send receiveth me. And he that receiveth me, him that sent me. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in the spirit and testified, and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Okay, now in verse number 2, you find that the devil had already put the thought in Judas Iscariot's heart to betray the Lord. But just like our pastor said, Judas gave place to that thought. He dwelled on it. He considered it, and from verse number 2 down to verse number uh, 19, or I'm sorry, not 19, verse number 21, Judas had been chewing on that thought, and he had decided that he was going to act on it, that he would betray him. That's why Jesus was troubled in the Spirit. He knew that one that had fellowshiped with him, 
that had lived with them, that had been there with them. And he may not have been all the way in, but he was one of the twelve. He got to see things, he got to hear things that nobody else heard. He spent time every day with God himself. And it troubled Jesus that one would choose to betray him. Keep in mind, he's robed in flesh, but he's still 100% God. His flesh was troubled because he just experienced betrayal. He didn't have to wait to see it come to fruition because being God, he knew Judas made up his mind. And he knew what it was to be backstabbed. Now granted, this was all foreordained. That's why it was written that he would be portrayed by one that broke bread with him from the very table that he sat at, one of his inner circle. He just told him, he said, I brought that up, that prophecy, so that you would know when it comes to pass that I am the Son of God. Okay, now if they hadn't figured that out by then, it wasn't written for them. He said it for us. We didn't see him. We didn't hear him. I've heard a still small voice but I've never heard it audibly. I've never seen the miracles, but he did all according to what the scriptures said because no man could have fulfilled that many prophecies, let alone one of them. Right, well, also side thought. God told me to say it, I'm going to say this. But Bob, you know why we as humans have such a hard time with pain, betrayal, being double crossed loss of a loved one or maybe someone that we care about because our bodies weren't designed to handle that God made Adam and Eve in a perfect environment where they would forever dwell with God he did not equip them to handle losing a loved one he didn't equip them to handle having someone that you trusted betray you why do you think that that promise that he'll never leave you nor forsake you is so sweet? He'll never pain you. Sin caused this body to feel pain. It wasn't God's will. Sin causes us to go to the grave. That's what that separation, that loss. So know that whenever we feel those things, that's why the brain can get overwhelmed and there's this thing called depression. Emotionally, you can be broken down. There's no shame in that. You know what that's saying? I'm human. God never intended you to feel that, but it's one of those consequences of sin. Well, why do I say that? Because Jesus had his spirit trouble. He wasn't depressed, but he knew that pain. The very God of heaven experienced what it was like to be betrayed by one of his friends so that when you were betrayed, he could strengthen you. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet was he without sin. He was betrayed. The devil tempted him to betray the Father after he had fasted for 40 days in the wilderness. What did he do? He resisted him. Quoted the scriptures to him, and then the devil flee. Or flew, whatever that word is. Fled. That's what I was looking for. Right, why do I bring that up? Because he understands all the pain. He understood the pain that Judas was about ready to experience after he came to himself and realized what he did. Judas was so overcome with guilt and the realization that he had betrayed the very Son of God that he went out and hung himself. He couldn't live with the shame. See, Jesus was tempted to do all of those things and did none of them. And he promised us that if we sought his face, if we ask, we shall receive. If we seek, we shall find. If we put on the whole armor of God, we'll be able to stand against the wiles of our enemy, the devil. What's all that mean? He's saying, if you just stand by me, you can overcome all of that and circumvent all that pain. Okay, now, Judas also missed out on some of the sweetest not saying the most powerful, not saying the greatest message. The greatest message ever preached was over in Matthew chapter 5. But what would you do with that? Chapter number 14, verse number 1. Let not your heart be in trouble. You believe in God, believe also in me. 
In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would, not, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. You know who didn't hear this passage? Judas. He had already received the sop, and he, Jesus told him, go and do quickly what you're about ready to do. Satan entered into him, and he is gone. Those that betray the Lord miss out on a whole lot of sweetness. Amen. You know why Judas hung himself? He had no hope. He had not received the son, he had betrayed him. Amen. And as a result of that betrayal, had no hope. You know why hope is so important? Hope will keep you together when everything else is trying to tear you apart. Because you know what hope is a byproduct of? Faith. And if you just hold on to that faith that says, I believe in God, so I believe also in Jesus. I will not let my heart be troubled. Because he went to go prepare a place for me, and he's going to come back and get me to take me to the place that he prepared for me. Why did Jesus start off in chapter number 14? Verse number 1, let not your heart be troubled, because he knew the disciples were going to be troubled very soon, and for about three days and three nights. We know that they all forsook him the last one to do so was the apostle John he was there until the Lord committed Mary into his watch care the mother of Christ and what did he do that very hour he took her into his own house Jesus made him leave I believe John go study it out read the book of John you'll find that there was a disciple that was known to the high priest that went in with Jesus as he was about ready to be put on trial. You know who that was? The Apostle John. Peter's at the door about ready to deny him three times. John's in there in the middle of the trial hearing him lie against his Savior. Lie against the one that he loves above all else. Because every time he got a chance he was over there with his head on the Lord's shoulder. Just saying, Lord, thank you for loving me. And he's got to listen to people come up with lies and be bribed to lie. Until eventually they ask him, have you said that you and the Father are one? That you're the same? Then they said that he committed blasphemy. That they were going to kill him. I believe John stuck with him until they made him leave. But even then, he had to leave. John felt like he betrayed him. Because Peter popped off at the mouth in this chapter and said, Lord, you don't need to die for me. I'd die for you, but you don't need to die for me. They saying, I'll go with you all the way to whatever end. Jesus said, you know, you'll deny me three times before the cock crows. But John went with them as far as he could. Never popped off and boasted that he would. He just said, I'm going with him and went until they made him leave him and he felt like he betrayed him even then so why are we bringing all this out we know that John did and John did everything that he could then the next place we find him he's there at the cross but he couldn't go through the hall of praetorium the scourging all the mocking Jesus didn't need anyone there for him but John just desired to be with him. He was the only apostle that saw him hanging on the cross because all the others were hiding. They had let their heart become troubled. John didn't fear the high priest. John didn't fear the soldiers at the cross for recognizing him. And as a reward for his faithful, faithfulness, he was entrusted with the care of Mary, the mother of Christ. Because Jesus wouldn't have fulfilled the law if he would have died without making sure that his mother would have been cared for because he was the eldest child. But even then, they said, what an honor, but now I have to leave. And then for three days and three nights, their hearts were troubled. They were in a house boarded up. They had the shutters closed. They had two by fours nailed to it over top. And the entire time, they're sitting there saying, well, were we wrong? Was he not the Messiah? 
Well, he just gave them all of this to prove that he was. But he told them, let not your heart be troubled. Why'd I say all that? Over the past six days, not counting yesterday, God's shown that he's serious about sin and revival. God's always serious, but he's manifested how serious he really is. Jesus, in these verses, is telling them, these things had to be accomplished, because without it, we wouldn't have our salvation. They had to be accomplished the way that they were accomplished, or else it wouldn't have been according to the way that God had planned it and prophesied it. Thus, Jesus would have been disobedient to the Father. So it had to happen this way. But revival doesn't have to come. One betrayed him that night because it had to be so. And Jesus knew who he had chosen. He knew when he called Judas that Judas would be the one. But he still loved him the same. He still gave him every opportunity to accept him as Savior. He still performed all the miracles in front of him that everybody else did. He loved Judas just as much as any of the others. John calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. But all of them felt that way. Just like all of us feel that way. You may say that God loved you, but I, I feel that he just loved me a little bit better. Why? Because I know how much he loves me. I've felt it. I've seen it. It's been revealed through his word. But all that love, all that time, Jesus showed them that he was real serious about being the Christ. Y'all realize in the past two weeks we've only had half a dozen kids saved? give or take unless I'm off on when Sammy got saved God's still serious but the question is will you betray him that word betray means to abuse someone's confidence God's done things around here that may not have been done in years decades in the past week I've never seen it as good as it was. Amen. Would you betray that grace and goodness of God? That confidence that he said, you're prepared for this. And if you prepare yourself for more, even greater things will happen. He told the disciples that, I mean, it was Nathaniel. He said, hey, you believe because I said I saw you underneath of the tree. He says, you're going to see greater things than that told him that he'd see angels ascending and descending into heaven there's greater than what we saw but you know who got to see that those that didn't betray him betrayal means to cause harm to someone else who entrusted you with something of theirs somebody entrusted you with a hundred dollars and you went out and spent it you betrayed them Someone told you to watch for an hour in the garden. But Mike preached on that message. Just one hour. Could you not watch one hour? What did they do? They betrayed the Lord's confidence in them. He said, I go to pray. You do the same thing. It's about ready to happen here in the next couple of chapters. What did they do? They betrayed the Lord's confidence. Betrayal means that you disregard somebody else's instruction and substitute it for your own. You know why that's a betrayal? Because you say, I know better than the one who told me. You reject him. Betrayal boils down to when someone asks you to give everything, you hold back part of it. When someone asks you for something, you agree to it and then you don't. Doesn't matter by 1% or 99%. Not doing it's a betrayal. Now, why don't I want to teach it? I don't want to teach this Sunday after revival. But, Josh, I want to get up here and talk about heaven, talk about how great God's been. When God's been great, heaven's going to be sweet. But we're still here. I've lost sleep over the fact that there was another one, at least one, I don't know. But I know that Brother Greg recognized that somebody else raised their hand Friday night that they were lost. 
And if Friday night wasn't enough to show them that God loved them, and that from what everybody else was doing, that knowing him is pretty sweet, I'm concerned. I know they're not guaranteed another opportunity. I pray that they'll get it. But one could have experienced what we experienced and have a first class ticket to hell. They were on the outside looking in. But I know when something's happening, even from a distance away, you can hear a commotion in the camp. You can hear the shout of the champion in the tribe of Judah. Well, he wasn't there yet physically, but one day he showed up. What were they shouting at that one day he was coming? That there was going to be a lion in the tribe of Judah. Uh, we can shout the rafters off. That's easy. That's worship. It's easy to say, God's been good to me. But here, Jesus gives them a whole lot of instruction. Starting in chapter number 14. Before he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. We don't have time to get through all of it. But you know what it all boils down to? Each one of them had to submit and say, even though I don't deserve for the Lord to wash my feet, I'm going to learn the lesson. What was the lesson? That by washing their feet, Jesus was glorifying God. Look with me, if you will. Okay. Verse number 16, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is no greater than the Lord. Again, lowercase l, he's not talking about God. He's talking about lords and masters in the world. Neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. Okay, well, what was the lesson that he was trying to say? He says, verse number 20, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He was saying, God called you all to be disciples. I honor you for your obedience and your willingness to follow after God by watching your feet. He's saying, by receiving you, because I sent you, I glorify myself. But he's saying, who sent me? The Father. He was saying, by showing respect to those that God sends, those that follow after God, you give glory and honor unto God. You're not doing it for their sake, you're doing it for the sake of the one that sent them. He's saying you don't disregard the servants because the Lord doesn't leave his house. But he sends servants out into the community. He sends people to go do tasks for him. Could he do them? Yes. But God chooses to let us serve him so that, one, we could have a relationship with him, we could fellowship with him. But also, he chose people to win other people. So when we receive those that are doing their best to follow after God, when we honor those that are doing their best, why do you think that the pastor had those young people come up here Friday night? We received them, we honored them, and by doing so, we exalted the Father that they were obedient to. Amen. They had to submit and realize that, oh, this is done for a purpose as an example for us. No, we don't deserve it. But does the servant really deserve to get honor and praise and glory just because of who his master is? Probably not. That servant could have been a bondsman. That servant could have been one that was set to go to prison but somebody paid his price and he didn't have to. Hello, that's us. He bought me out of hell with his own blood. So of course I'm going to love him. Of course I'm going to try and do my best to follow after him. But the point that Jesus is making, is, it doesn't matter who you are. As long as you're on the master's business, if somebody receives you, they receive God. So be good to the people that receive you. Well, who's received us? We are received in the beloved. We are a member of the bride of Christ. Christ himself received us. Not because we were worthy, but so that God could be glorified. So that a relationship that was once broken could be mended and one day be restored for all eternity. Amen. And Jesus was so serious about it 
that he changed his clothes, girded himself with a towel, and humbled himself before men that that day would lie that they didn't know Christ. That that day would betray him. Why? As a lesson. It's not the lesson we're talking about. But the point is, some of them got it. Peter didn't get it at first. Because he said, Lord, not me. I should be washing your feet right now. After he got it, he said, I want to get all the way in. Just, just go ahead and be sure, get my hair. Jesus said, not necessary, Peter. I'm God, I know what I'm doing. So I said that to say this. I don't know what the lesson is today. I don't know what you need in order for revival to happen to you. You know why? Because I don't know what it takes to have revival. I've never seen it. I've never experienced it. None of these men knew what was just about ready to happen. But Jesus knew one was going to betray him. But he still had the opportunity to get in. But he didn't want the Lord to be his Lord and Master. Whether we recognize him as such or not, he is. That's what he said down in verse number 13. You call me Master and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. He's God. Of course he's Master and Lord. But not everybody calls him that. Everybody that calls him that doesn't live that. I don't know what it takes to have revival. But God does. And I got about three hours of sleep last night because I was up saying, Lord, this ain't enough. And he says, yep, yeah, it is. Just calm down. And so this is what we're going to do. About 25 minutes until church starts. I don't care. We're going to get in this altar. And each one of us is going to ask God, Lord, what do I need? What am I missing? What am I doing that doesn't comply with what you want in order to have revival? We heard Friday night. If we was ready for it, God would have dumped it out. So I know we're not. But if we don't get ready, we betray Him. We forsake Him. We're just as guilty after being saved of nailing Him to another cross and saying, I don't want you in my life. You stay over there. I don't want what you want. I'm fine with coming and worshiping, having a good time. I'm fine with listening to preaching because I ignore it most of the time and don't do it. So if you're serious about revival, I'm going to ask you to come to the altar. I'm not going to pray out loud. I'm going to go right over there where I prayed all week because God helped me over there. So I'm going back over there. And if you're serious, it won't matter if they start playing music. It won't matter if people come in. You're going to stay on the altar until you get an answer. Now, you may be ready. Jesus said, ye are clean, but not all. He was talking to Peter there. He said, Peter, you don't have anything right now in your life. He's saying, he said, there will be later. You're going to have to give, confess to that for betraying him, for denying him three times. Peter was guilty of betraying him, not to the high priest and to those that wanted him dead, but betraying him as his Lord and Savior. Because the little maid came up and said, aren't you one of him? What if she said, if Peter said yes, what if she said, he doesn't deserve all that. I saw him do something. I want to know him as Savior. Peter could have helped that young lady. But instead he ruined his testimony in front of her. Started talking so foul that eventually they said, there's no way that he knows Jesus because he wouldn't talk that way. What am I saying? If God's trying to get you in and you're hesitant, you're still holding on to something, in the flesh, you may ruin the rest of your life trying to avoid just giving it all to Jesus. Maybe you're in the right spot. In Galatians, the Apostle Paul wrote, praying always, right, in the Spirit, in the very next verse he says put on the whole armor of God you know why we need to pray even though we got the armor on Lord is there a chink in my armor am I relying on 
a breastplate of my righteousness instead of your righteousness? Because the dart's going to get through the breastplate if it's my righteousness. Lord, is my faith waning? Help mine unbelief so that the shield of faith quenches the fiery darts of the enemy. Lord, am I ready to go in peace and tell others that revival's happening? Am I wholly relying upon your truth instead of my sense of what's going on? I, like, I don't like getting up here and not knowing what's going to happen. No preacher does. But here's the thing. It's all in God's hands. I don't know what you need today. If God tells you everything's good, start praying for the man of God back there. he got to get up in a pulpit after a week-long revival where people, some people are expecting it to fall. Because not all because God wasn't giving me this some aren't all the way hooked up I'll be honest very thankful for what was going on Amen. about Wednesday I walked in I told Brother Bobby we were sitting right over there I said Monday night it got real high in here Tuesday night there was some healing that went on I said I've been talking to God all day tonight's the night that the hammer falls and we heard it it was get in or get out. And then Thursday and Friday, still people not all the way in. Today's the day that the Lord has made. So it's your day to do business with God or risk all of eternity having to answer for my pride, my stubbornness. So if you're serious, I'd ask you to come and get in the altar. If you're not, don't put on a show. Don't grieve the Holy Ghost. Don't quench the Holy Ghost. If you want to, get out of the sanctuary. But don't go out there and start talking because there's people in here trying to do business with God. And I would caution you not to come back until you're ready to do business with God. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.